Hey, you guys, just wanted to let you know we have an amazing show called The Game Changer Show each and every single Wednesday at 6 p.m. GMT, where we interview uh, entrepreneurs, athletes alike. Uh, it gives people uh, an, op- an opportunity to listen to people's story, how they made some, how they've kind of uh, really turned their business around. Uh, it's fun. It's thought provoking. It's an opportunity to ask questions uh, and it's interactive. So if you want to come uh, and hang out with some cool people, uh, 6 p.m. PM, please go to uh, youtube.com forward slash sleep forward slash Adam Strong. Uh, subscribe and click on the bell, and we'll see you there on Wednesday at 6 p.m. GMT. Cheers. Take care. This is the Game Changers Experience. Deep dive conversations with leading business disruptors, Olympic athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and influencers from around the world. This show will teach you insights about the winning principles in mindset, productivity, marketing, branding, entrepreneurship, business strategy, and more. Hosted by Productivity Authority, business strategist, former elite athlete, author, and public speaker, Adam Strong. Our speaker of today, his name's Glenn Flashman, as you'll see. His name's called the Tattooed Tycoon. You're probably thinking, why is he called the Tattooed Tycoon? Well, you could probably see that from his arms. His body is covered 70% in tattoos and he wants to get to 90%. So he's the current CEO of the year in the UK for 2020, I believe. He, run, he runs actually the one of the biggest tattoo, it's not a franchise, but tattoo business essentially in the UK. I think it's about 45 studios or 45 outlets um, around the UK. So he's got, he's the biggest fish in the pond as such. What else going to say? He used to work in, used to be in the British Army, transitioned into project management into the city, and now is a uh, entrepreneur running his own business. And but has what, what? What's interesting about Glenn is that he's probably had more bankruptcies and failed businesses than most people will have in a lifetime. And and he's and he and his and his motto is is that he never wants to go. He's, he's what I call unemployable, a bit like me and is teaching others to become also unemployable. So um, without further ado, big round of applause, Mr. Glenn Flashman. Woo! Thank you, guys. Adam, that, that was a fantastic intro. Hey, come on. You, I mean, seriously. I know, it's like, it's almost like being, was it, was, who was the guy who used to do the Red Book? This is your life. It was almost a little <laughs> bit like that, a bit of a Damon flash. Andrews. Damon Andrews. Damon Andrews, that was the guy. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but bless his heart. So yeah, that was a great intro. Thank you, mate. You're welcome. And almost, factually, almost factually correct as well. So <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It's all good. So what I was going to say, guys, the whole point of today's session, more importantly, is we're going to be doing a slightly different session. Normally, when it comes to our speakers, our speakers normally give some content, some presentation or whatever it is. How did I meet Glenn? Well, I met Glenn through Clubhouse, believe it or not. We met through, we met about about six, seven weeks ago, I reckon, probably about that, maybe a couple yeah, of months ago. Yeah, probably a bit longer than that, mate, maybe. About a couple of months ago. Uh, two and, months. Yeah. yeah. And so so you guys might be familiar. Well, John Fuggles knows because he's been in once and he can't join us today. But I run a room called No Ego and No BS because one of the things that really drives me insane, especially when you're on Clubhouse, is listening to false promises and um, zillionaires that make these ridiculous, act, you know, ridiculous, those, you know, whatever it is that they're offering or whatever it is. And this kind of formulated the no ego, no BS room. And Glenn has been there from the very beginning. And I think we are five weeks in, six weeks in, something like that. I can't remember. Um, and we are on there every Monday and Friday, 7 p.m. UK time. We're actually going to be shifting that a little bit earlier just to play around with the time. So that's how we met. But also what I love about Glenn is he does very much have this kind of what I no bullshit, raw, authentic attitude, which is very similar values from me. And so, mate, great to have you anyway. Thank you, mate. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. And yeah, I think that we were we're kindred spirits, really, aren't we? We've had lots of phone calls afterwards and lots of Zooms and everything (laughs) else. So Yeah, it's, uh, it's all good. And normally, uh, we normally we speak each other and leave voice messages on each other's WhatsApp on a daily basis. So, um, you know, turn into a really good friend, Glenn. So, guys, what I want to do today is I want to, um, rather than kind of making this a presentation style, I want to turn this into kind of more of a, um, this is my challenge in my business, okay? Now, Glenn's area of expertise, actually, he's got 
essentially a huge amount of ex area of ex uh, industry experience in the bricks and mortar industry. He's actually created a formula well, well now that where he's been able to build and scale companies, more specifically to bricks and mortar content uh, co businesses. But he's also got a business which is all based around content creation and social media, which is what we've been talking about today, Glenn, by the way, okay. which, which I found was really good in terms of entwinement and interconnection. So it's going to make it really easy in terms of transition. So in terms of you guys, what I'd like to do is I want this session to be really kind of to be about you rather than kind of be about us. But for you to think about a particular question. Now, I want to I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to Glenn to get the ball, ball rolling. And then afterwards, what I'd like to do is I'd like to then open that room up to you guys. If you're stuck in your business, whether it be a if you've got a challenge, if you've got a bottleneck, if you are thinking about what exactly where you're at in terms of your journey, Sarah's at a different journey, Lisa, you're on a different journey, and you're all going to have different challenges when you're in a business. Glenn has probably lived and breathed every mistake, bankruptcy, and whatever it is, and he's going to be able to really kind of help, I suppose, uh, give you some advice about what how he's experienced it and stuff like that does that sound fa sound like a plan glenn yeah i mean absolutely i mean i can give a bit more of a a bit more of a, an idea of where i've come from and and how i've done it really and and then and then go from there in terms of the bottlenecks because it's it's almost what we do in a clubhouse room where mm. um, before we did the pitching it was a mm. case of you know this is this is my ask and how do i do it really so yeah um do you want me to just to crack up a little bit yeah absolutely G give us a bit of a background story that'd be great mate Okay, so 16 years old, I joined the British Army and realised that it's quite good fun, but there's a bit more to it. It doesn't pay the bills as much as I, I wanted to. And I left and I became a management consultant. I worked for McKinsey's and then I went to Accenture, as it's currently known. Uh, and I was a young lad in the office doing all the dot-coms. Didn't really have a clue about dot-com, um, but it was then from in the investment side of it. So I got involved with the investment banking side uh, quite quickly on and then got courted by what became the, Europe's largest internet-based company. Um, we were going around through fourth and fifth round funding. We were all millionaires on paper at 25 years old, all driving Porsches around London, thinking we're living the dream. And then lo and behold, I went into the office one Saturday morning and I was the current COO. And I'd realized I read in the paper, it was the independent that told us that we'd gone bust. Oh. And so it was a real massive shock. Um, I was a brought in director. I wasn't a shareholder. And so it was, it was a massive lesson learned for me. Mm. And I thought, actually, you know, I, I need to get out of here and, and do something different than just standard, straightforward financial building. Mm -hmm. um, and so I worked, went and worked for Coca-Cola, uh, which was probably one of the best companies apart from my own that I've worked with in terms of how to create a team looking at fast moving consumer goods and distribution. Uh, and then from there, I thought, you know what, it's now about time that I, I want to branch out onto my own. And so all through all throughout my life, I'd, I've kind of had mentors and didn't really know I had them. Yeah. My current mentor has now become an extremely good friend of mine. He's an Anglo Irishman um, living in uh, between New York, Miami, Ireland and London. And so we try and catch up uh, pre COVID every month for a meal. Um, and some of the stuff that he said to me even 20 years ago is quite funny because it's coming back through now in, in the COVID world. So, and I'll talk a bit more about that. So I, I started up a company. Um, we were one of the first ever uh, companies to have a factory in, in Beijing. We were an Eng English uh, Beijing partnership. We were one of the first ISO 9001 for quality management. And I exited out of that business some about five years ago now. Um, after a 10 year stint and we were distributing to 22 countries worldwide about 10,000 products a week uh, worldwide uh, we were one of the first ever companies to set up a distribution plant in Azerbaijan for the Southeast Asian and, and uh, Emirates market um, and it was great and then so I did what we all did which is bought a Ferrari got married and sat on a beach for six months and then thought actually this is rubbish so I got rid of the beach, got rid of the Ferrari and got rid of the wife <laughs> and uh, decided, to, decided to do something a lot more interesting. And one of the things I remember my mentor saying to me was that in actual fact, the only way really to scale your business is if you don't work in it. And it 
probably took me 20 years to understand that concept. Mm. So I decided what I would do, I'd, I'd test it. So I'm very much about testing. And if it works, repeat, rinse, repeat. And so the first thing I did was, what? Well, let's buy a coffee shop. I knew nothing about coffee, apart from I liked it. Knew nothing about the industry, nothing about the business. And very, very quickly, we went from one to 26 coffee shops. We were buying about at about 1.6% profit, uh, one time, 1.6 times profit EBITDA. And we eventually sold the group to a private equity fund at about eight times profit. Was this, a, an, thought, ind- was this an independent or was this a franchise? The bought it. Yeah. Independent. Oh, independent. No, but the coffee yeah. shops, was, was that like a cost of franchise or was that your own? No, no, we never franchised. So that oh. the model was very much a case of buying independent coffee shops. Ah. We wanted to buy from distressed owners, not distressed businesses. Got it. Turning over between 250 and about 600,000 was our kind of comfortable price point. Nice. I, I don't do property. I stay in my lane. So we were any, any independents that had proper mortar, we would have a partner that would buy the property. We would sign a 15, 25 year lease on. That so that, that was kind of the first key was to see if it worked. And we kept all of the brands independent. We never franchised. We did look at it as a model. and We were very much turned off by it. Mm. And then so I thought the next thing is we've done that once. Let's see if we do a rinse repeat. And I thought, well, what else do I not know about? And quite clearly, Adam and I are in the same club. So I bought hairdressers. <laughs> um, in a slight, slightly different way, the model was now about, about being a bit more focused on our exit rather than on the, the growth and the, the scalability. Got it. Um, and we identified someone that we kind of wanted to align with on exit. Uh, and we got, we thought we'd get to about 30 independents and we got to 15 and we got a buyout from the guy that we thought would, would take it on. And then the last one that we did, uh, apart from this one, so number three, um, so was nightclubs. And we thought we'd have a look at uh, buying nightclubs late 2019. And we got to three of those. And the guy that was involved in the property deals on those said, can I buy them? And so we actually got to technically four. Now, the interesting thing about that was, um, so this is late 2019, early 2020. And we actually signed the deal on the 20th of March, 2020. <laughs> one, day, one day before the closures for COVID. Oh, my God. Um, I know. And he is a friend, but um, that relationship was strained for some time. But he's now looking forward to uh, to be opening up and, and doing great guns. Wow. Um, on top of all of that, I, I also had, so this is through my uh, my investment company, my private equity company called Autonary. Yeah. And it's all self-funded through my, my, my first exit out. And outside of that group, I, I've had a massive interest in tattooing for a number of years. And we got to six studios. 2020, we then decided, 2019, 2020, we'd, we'd start to look at doing the same rinse repeat with tattoo studios, which everyone kind of thinks it's a bit rock and roll. Um, <laughs> it's a fantastic business. It's a cottage industry, really, that has really poor customer services. And we decided, in actual fact, we'd take more of a corporate structure and put that into there and raise the level of the game. Uh, and again, same model. Anything probably up to a million turnover is what we were looking to buy. Nice. We've now got quite a few. We've got 46. We bought 13 last year through lockdown, which is very difficult to buy a, a business when someone's going around with a laptop showing you the building on Zoom because <laughs> uh, you can't actually go around there. But we, we did it. We got a couple over the line. Wow. But, but it hasn't always been a success. You know, there's been some trials and tribulations. This year, I have to say, that it's been a terrible year. Uh, we normally have about eight deals in the pipeline going through and we we've got we had five and we never got any single one of them over the line so wow. this this year so far has been a hundred percent failure in getting more studios the other part of that is that in terms of the um the pe the private equity company is that we've now become too big so i am the, the largest independent owner of tattoo studios in the uk and we don't have anyone to exit out with so we're now looking at a way to try and pivot the business purely based on the cash flow that hopefully we'll be generating because we've been closed for nine months for the last 18 months of trading in effect. Yeah. Um, so we're all looking forward to the 12th of April so we can open and start putting some money back in the, the cupboard that's a little bit bare, shall we say. 
on the back of that, 2019, I'd been, I'd been kind of consulting and mentoring companies of all different uh, ilks, really, high net worth individuals, companies, corporations, uh, in terms of doing what I do, um, helping business. And very much behind the scenes, it's really where I've liked it, um, adding value, huge amounts. And then I got nominated for CEO of the year um, through Tattoo Tycoon, which is a mentoring company, by my client, which was Mercedes-Benz. We did a project with them in Miami. Uh, it was a television advert. It's on the website. And I didn't think we'd get it at all. I was nominated. I was shortlisted to eight. And the team here that I had said, look, if, if you win this, you're going to have to step in front of the camera. Um, and lo and behold, I fucking won it, didn't I? And I only, <laughs> I only, I only found out, literally, it was the 27th of December when the award came through the post to the office. I didn't actually officially get told it. Um, because we hit COVID again on the 18th of December. Yes. So, we knew, and so that now is being, um, I believe, April edition is coming out and, and I'm in the April edition. I've got the award. I, I kind of kept it a little bit under wraps. But that that is a great business in terms of just doing what we do in terms of mentoring and helping. We, we have three entries. We've actually got five packages now. Yeah. Uh, which is a, a, a one-to-many offering on our Bright program for pre-startup uh, and, and pre-turnover, really, which is a four-week course. We then go into Evolution, which is a six-month course, which is for someone that's started to trade and then goes, what the fuck do I do now? Yeah. And then we then have an accountability section where companies that are just like all of you guys that are entrepreneurs that go, actually, I just want someone to talk to that's going to give me maybe some strategic steer. And we've seen a massive uplift in that since December. Yeah. Uh, and they get me for two hours or they get one of the team for a couple of hours as well. And then my one-to-one -one offering, which is the, the real bespoke, almost non-exec director role. Um, and I only work with you for three months. Um, it's very much project-based. It's very much a deep dive. It's very disruptive in your business. Mm. It takes a huge amount out of me and the team. Um, we actually ratio it to about one hour of meeting Zoom to about two or three hours offline. Um, and the best part of that, it's connecting dots. You know, that's what you do, Adam. That's what I do as entrepreneurs. We know people uh, and we go, actually, this is a business that I can help. Uh, and we go from there. So fast forward to literally this weekend when we actually closed the deal was that one of the biggest parts of it was our, uh, our media offering. And uh, we've now managed to uh, secure another director to come on board. Uh, and she's absolutely phenomenal. It's a, it's a she and she's extremely young, but is brilliant. And we're very, very pleased to have her on board. And then lo and behold, we kind of did that. And yesterday we've just been nominated for um, one of the top 50 fastest growing companies in 2021 by Silicon Valley magazine. Oh. So it's all moving at a, a massively rapid pace. Um, Tycoon's doing really well. We've got a full, what I call, revolutionary consultancy now. And we also have a very, very strong offering, not just within digital platforms, but also across traditional marketing and media as well. So post-production, videoing, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's uh, bankrupt Stop. twice, as you well pointed out. <laughs> so I know the mistakes not to do. And I've had that absolutely sinking feeling where you're, you're all in, as in literally all in, your house is up, your house gets taken away. You move back to mum and dad's and drive a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> and you literally, and, and I've been there and I've done it, you know? So yeah, every, anything it. right the way through. Uh, and even now, even helping businesses to get to exit. So that's a little bit about me, what we do here. Be interested to hear what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. We did uh, introductions at the beginning and stuff, but I know that Hillary and Tom and a couple of others have sort of came in and whatever it is. Before I kind of open it to these guys, actually, I know that you mentioned in your conversation around for 20 years, you, tr you were trying to figure out how to kind of make a transition of taking yourself out of the business. Yeah. What were the, why did it take so long? Number one, and what was, what was the reason? Why did it take so? Yeah. Why did it take so long? Number one, what is it that you discovered? Uh, easy ego. Um, I have quite a big ego, which I've now managed to rein in a little bit. And uh, we, all, we all do. Realistically, we all do have an ego, but, sure. but some of it's actually gargantuan. And 
if, honestly, if you told me I had a chance to be the next uh, astronaut up in space, I, I would think I could do it. So it, it's a case of actually my ego completely got in the way. I, I wanted to dominate and do everything myself. Mm. So you can imagine like the kid at school, you know, writing out an, ex an exam and, and not getting his mates to copy it. That was me. I wanted to absolutely do, do everything myself. Yeah. And so when I actually realized yeah. that the, the real strength is in collaboration, you then realize how fast you can scale. Yeah. And speed of implementation for me is absolutely vital on any project that we take on, whether that be a, a new studio through uh, the PE or, or through uh, Tattoo Tycoon. Yeah, cool. So, guys, what I want to do now is I want to sort of give a couple of you guys, uh, I suppose, an, an opportunity. I mean, you now know more about Glenn. I've introduced Glenn. Glenn's introduced himself as well and, and his background and stuff. I know that you all have different businesses, mainly service-driven companies, which is kind of cool. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to offer you guys, I suppose the question for me to ask you is, in terms of where you're at in terms of your business, what is the big sticking point that's going to take you from here to here? What is the thing that's getting in the way in terms of the middle, okay, where you think, I, I just cannot master it. I can't figure it out. I, I, I've tried this and I've tried that, right? Maybe there's something that's kind of really kicking in your head that, you, that this would be, just be a, a real great opportunity to really kind of open it up a little bit. And I know that, I know most of you pretty well in terms of that. So if you'd like to ask Glenn or myself a question with regards to this, Let's make it open book and, you know, have your notebooks and pens handy. Who would like to ask a question? Because if not, I will continue to ask questions, by the way. So don't be shy. So who, who wants to kind of move forwards? Heather? No, Hillary and Heather. Sorry, I didn't see Hillary because I, I, I've got her on a different screen. Can, can I? Can, uh, okay. Let's bring Hillary on first. Is that all right, Heather? Yeah, okay. My question isn't necessarily about my sticking points, but from all the companies that you've been helping, what would you say in the startup, the sort of one to six months, 12 months phase is there, is the most common issue that they come across, just in case I haven't come across it yet. <laughs> What's your business, Hilary? Pleased to meet I, you. Right? I help sole traders with accountability. So I keep them accountable for doing the, getting them to work on their business, not just in it this is interesting you want me to advise you so then you can charge and they get your advice from me why not <laughs> why not i think it's a great idea <laughs> why not why not uh well i'll tell them to come and have a chat with me first but then um, if we're going to do that through you I, I would say that the biggest thing i get in terms of we're talking trading or we're talking pre-startup trading okay sales realistically everyone doesn't like the word sales and if there was another word that we could use business developments thrown around i hate that word um it's hardcore sales people don't understand the journey um for me in terms of what i class as a business uh, and please use this because the more people that are going to put this message out makes my job easier um i think for me a business is something that has scale if, if you can't scale your business, whether you're in it or out of it, you have a lifestyle job. Now, that's not to say that a lifestyle job is a bad thing at all. I know people that are doing half a million pound lifestyle jobs and good luck to them. That's exactly where they want to be. But they're going to have to be working that business day in, day out, especially if it's a service based business. Now, for me, a business has lots of the elements to it, but in, in essence, I look at business like a cake factory. So a cake factory has key elements to it that, that make it run. And Adam's laughing because you've probably heard me say this before, but realistically, I keep things really simple and really blunt. So in terms of, of a business, uh, a proper business, not a lifestyle job, it has raw ingredients. So if it's a product-based business, that's really easy. We know what our raw ingredients are. If it's a, if it's a service-based business, those raw ingredients are the people that are in the business and their skill set and why are they an, an authority of some description? And they're your key, key ingredients. That then moves over to the cake mixing bowl, and then you make your cake, whatever that might be, by mixing all of those ingredients up. They're then packaged through the marketing division that have a nice fancy box for it and a name, and it's normally pushed out through a distribution channel to two ways. One is a business to consumer, so I, I'm selling my cake direct to the person, 
or it's business to business. I'm selling it to Sainsbury's that they can sell it on to someone or a Costa or whatever it might be. And what most of us do, we don't plan that last mile. We get all excited about the raw ingredients. We get really excited about the mixing. Marketing ego gets in the way and go, wow, this is great, this amazing product. And we forget about the sales. And so for me, I always try and turn things the other way. I say, okay, I don't really care about the raw ingredients because I can get them pretty much now with the internet anywhere. Uh, I don't really care realistically on how we make them because there are loads of processes to do that. Marketing are really good and to get good marketeers is, is expensive. So you find your level there, but all of that needs to glue together and that's glued together by the customer. And so I find that most businesses, whether it's a lifestyle job or whether it is actually uh, a scaling business, doesn't understand who they're selling to. So for me, um, to answer your question is what is the common theme that most of the businesses that I help uh, have trouble with? It's sales. Thank you. Does that kind of answer your question or do you want to deep a bit more dive into that? No, no, that, that's fine. That's good. Thank would you. you. Would you agree with the companies that you're dealing with, Hilary? Um, no, I actually think their, their issue is, is a lot not focusing on the finances. A lot, a lot of them don't. It's not something they look at even monthly. And yeah. until they do, then they don't understand where their business is going. So it's fine. a lot of them have a very, very good idea of who they're selling to. You're pretty big on the numbers, have, aren't you? Know, yeah. They've got a lot of... Yeah, I'm massive on the numbers. I mean, I was about to say that Adam and I, we, for the last couple of, uh, of the clubhouse weeks, we've done a pitch room. Mm. And the thing that we now pre... Uh, preload in effect the, the people that come up on stage is don't come asking what your want is without knowing the numbers and you are right people have lit i've got a client of mine at the moment fantastic business um ballsy really ballsy because it's a, it's a crowded marketplace um and she's all in and i said well, what did you turn over last month she went what i said what did you turn over last month no idea okay what did you what did you turn over last year in covid no idea and we're talking seven figures and she has no idea yeah uh, that, that's exactly exactly why I'm, I'm coming across and once we start focusing on that everything else seems to fall into place so i, I would then probably guess that most of the businesses that you're dealing with are quite creative because it's normally the creative guys have absolutely no fucking clue about the numbers they really uh, don't. they've got these great ideas and they yeah. start delivering them and then they wander off to the next idea yeah. so, <laughs> one of the things yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things that we always do, especially on my Bright, which is my entry and my evolution program, we have a whole month called being a geek on the numbers. Mm -hmm. And we actually try and make the numbers fun and relevant to them. Once they see a relevancy to it, it's an easy connect. At the moment, there's a massive disconnect. Yeah. So, yeah, my advice is get them to be a geek on the numbers because it will revolutionize their business. I try. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I succeed. I succeed. <laughs> the other way of doing it, Hillary, as well, is that we obviously have a, a quite a good deal team in terms of what I'm doing the acquisitions. And, you know, people, when they work with you, they kind of say, well, who do you use? So I always recommend a, a really good accountancy firm that we've been using for a number of years now and offload all of that. Because then if I needed to, if I need to deep dive back into that person's business, I can speak to the, their accountant and then that just gives me the geeky bits I need. Yeah. Okay, yep. thank you. Good, good no question, problems. Hilary. Well done. Heather, do you want to go next? Thanks, nice Pam. Uh, hi again, Glenn. <laughs> hi, yeah. When we were chatting on Friday, which was which was great, nice impromptu sort of uh, coaching session, it was grand. We were talking a little bit about the uh, the coffee business. It is it is something that for me is is not scalable. I'm working on some other things that are absolutely scalable and and kind of where my passion life I have a passion for coffee but not enough for it to be my sole income source and I get that interestingly enough so having made the decision at the weekend I'm like going to walk away from that side of things particularly selling coffee machines does my head in can't be bothered with other people's hassles I've had three inquiries in two days and I'm like no I don't want to do this anymore I want to walk away I want to walk away and then suddenly you get these inquiries and I find it because there's because I have an emotional attachment, it's got my name on the door. So, yeah, it's how do I kind of do that thing where there is something that keeps pulling me back? And it, it, it has kept pulling me back for a number of years. Adam's known me for seven years. 
and this has kind of been a slight millstone around my neck for quite some time because it doesn't it doesn't make money yet we we, we talked about that on friday as to which yeah. it doesn't make money it it's not consistent enough and it's not scalable okay interesting one all that from friday and you made decisions so i'm really pleased that you <laughs> i was quite I, yes all credit to you but also i was quite far along it and it just you it was that last lemming over the bloody edge thing so thank you <laughs> So look, I would say that there's one thing that I never ever claim to be, but everyone says that I have, which is I'm not a mindset coach. I'm really, really not. There's plenty of, you know, the amount of mindset coaches that have managed to pivot and do businesses over COVID, it's amazing. And I think they're all shit to be fair. <laughs> um, so in, in my, that's my opinion, but I, I don't have a mindset coach because I think if you have a passion for business, then you work out your mindset. You, and and my, my view on mindset realistically is if you don't like the landscape, change the fucking view. Whatever you need to do, just change the view. Whether you have to pivot, turn around, do something different. And so it's interesting you're saying what you're saying. What's pulling you back is your ego. Realistically, that's the only thing, because you've just said it yourself, there's an emotional attachment to that business. Yeah. So I would say maybe relook at it and try and outsource it. If you can outsource that as a business, and let's say it brings you in, I don't know, 100 grand a year, mm -hmm. it's worthwhile doing. If it isn't doing that, or it's stopping you doing the, the bit that you do want to do, yeah. you've got to weigh it up financially. So I, I, that's why, I mean, Adam says already, geek on the numbers. If I can put in a provision that allows me to sell that product, service the customer really, really well, and I'm guessing anything you've got like a product that might go wrong, you'll need to have that full returns and bits and pieces part of that as well. And, and that's 100 percent that that needs to be looked after by somebody else. If you can okay. do that. And you know the hassles. Yeah. And it is a nightmare. And it's always when you least need it. Where are you buying the product from? I have. So I have two suppliers. I use Pacino and Jura. So where are they based in, in Italy? Oh, uh, yeah. One one's they are you. Uh, they are. One's a Swiss company, but I work with the with the UK thing, and the other is a UK company. So they they are UK based. That's not a problem. It's more it's the day to day maintenance stuff. Operations. And these are large uh, machines for baristas, yeah. Yeah, and and big offices as well. Okay, what's the average sale price? Between four and eight grand. Okay, and profit margin percentage? Forty percent. It's not, it's, a, it's not huge. It's, it's, it's nice. I think probably, you know, COVID times, it's been, it's been a nice, it's been a very nice to have when they've come through the door, but ongoing, as I say, it's totally in that respect, not viable. Okay. Do you, do you have sole supplier agreements in place with the company or are there other people selling your products? Other people. I am one of a number of distributors for them, uh, resellers. Do you know who the largest is? They're one of the, it's one of the online sort of Nesbit type people. Try and sell it to them. Yeah. You, you've got a value there. You've got a customer base and people want that land grab. I think we, have, we've got a Zoom booked in, haven't we, Heather? Uh, we have, yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper into that. But I, I wouldn't bin it. I, I would, there's because the value there. You've got customers and customers' data is always really interesting. Yeah. So even, if, even if you sell it for 10 grand, you know, just mm. to get rid of it, get rid of it. Currency. Um, but don't get rid of it and not do anything with it. Yeah, that's what I would do. And, and, then, and leave the ego at the door. Do you know what? I mean, to give you an example, every single year, I always try and do other businesses. So I'll give you one that I did last year that was an absolute fucking disaster. <laughs> um, and, it's, and it was a disaster because it was the wrong timing. Mm -hmm. So it was called the Auto Box. And it was a provision for guys, predominantly guys, to hide their mo motorbikes from their wives. So rather than storing them in the shed, they'd store them in the auto box and they could come out of the weekend and play with the toys and put them back in the wife never knows about it. In actual fact, it's a really great concept. But the downside is that the guys also want to drop down to the back of the garage and have a little polish of their bikes on probably a weekendly basis. So it didn't really kind of work. Um, the concept's fantastic and it can probably scale. It probably is more classic car storage than it is motorbikes. But that project was 20 grand. And we closed it down. We just didn't work. I did four of those last year. Two years ago, I did a project that did 750,000. So you kind of go, okay.
So I wouldn't ever say that it's your ego and it was a failure. It's a learning curve. So what did I learn from that, that mistake? Well, I learned it was the great, great marketing, great product, wrong location, and probably wrong demographic. So you can still take and use those lessons. You, if you ever got another product coming online that you go, actually, I could sell this. This has, I can scale it better. I can service it better. I can outsource it and still make money. You've learned loads with doing what you've done with a coffee machine. 100%. 100%. So all you've got to do now is take that coffee machine product, throw it out, keep your structure exactly the same, maybe, maybe tighten up on it a little bit, put another product in. Because if you can passively income that, why not? Yep. So yeah, Brilliant. don't leave your ego at the door. Just just do what I do. Just rein it in a little bit. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. It's cool. I'll Thank speak to you next week, Heather. Brilliant. Look forward to it. Very good. Who else wants to ask uh, Glenn a question? Daryl or Tom or any of you guys? Yeah, big wanna... Daryl who's in the bottom there. I'd like to know what you do, Daryl. Daryl was a very interesting guy. Good. Let's hear it. How you doing, Daryl? Take yourself off mute, mate. Yeah, I learned a cunning trick the other day. Apparently, if you leave it on mute and then you press the space bar, it's unmute on Zoom. It changed my life. There you go. <laughs> you're, still that, you're still learning that skill, and I take it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, no, good to meet you, Glenn. Um, basically, I run a brand marketing agency. We started the brand marketing agency in the charity, took a whole load of young kids and volunteers that knew nothing about brand, and spent eight years in the charity educating and building until we grew too big to stay in the charity. 2016, the, co the company came out, the charity became its own limited company. Good. It kept going and growing. So that was really cool. And then I've also run a software company, which we started in December, got lots of projects at the moment. So we've got capacity, you know, we want to get more, more work in, which is great. We just need to get more devs in, which is always the hard thing to find. Um, so that's all good. We've got a brand automation tool that we've built an MVP for. Um, where you answer a series of questions. It's built for startups and entrepreneurs. And by the time you finish doing the questions, the whole brand's been built and it all lives on the dashboard and you can download all the assets, your pop-up stand, your fly, your fonts, your logo, your social media banners. So we're in the process of bid writing for that with Innovate UK. Um, so yeah, that's, that keeps well, me that's Very good. Is that on a subscription model you're going to try and sell that out? Or how are you going to sell it? Yeah, so initially when we built it, it was like a one-off fee, and we've made some sales, you know, one-off fees and stuff. But yeah, we we 100% get the the real money is in the subscription, and that's what we're looking at in terms of do they pay that per month, or what other services that we can build into it to be you know make them keep coming back. For instance, automating social media, automating video editing, automating blog writing, that sort of stuff. I'd be interested in a call on that if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries, Glenn. Love to. Um, if you can search Tattooed Tycoon on all the social media channels, there's always a link to my Calendly. Yeah. And if you book yourself a 30-minute call with me, I'm more than happy to give you 30 minutes of my time and have a chat. Yeah, no problem. There might be some synergies there. And there also might be some clients that we have that might be able to use that service or we could take it in-house and third-party or do whatever we need to do. That sounds quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's good. And it's always nice to hear someone from Essex. I was originally from Rayleigh, so... I won't hold that against you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say to you, actually, Daryl, with your automation tool that you created, it'll be really interesting to see what, if it is a subscription model, the longevity of when it's up and running, how long a customer will stay with you based on the services that you give. Because what you've created is essentially a service, right, where they've got basically everything. Okay, their brand, their fonts, their title, whatever it is. Do they then say, oh, okay, well, fantastic. I've got this. Now I can just drop off subscription. Does that make sense? So it'd be really interesting to see what, um, how you're kind of, because that to me is like, well, that's interesting. How do we then take this to the next stage? Yeah, the main thing is, you know, everyone, everyone, it's like a necessary evil. We talked about it today is generating mm -hmm. content for social media. So mm -hmm. once you've got the materials, is how do you automate, how do you more automate posts, for instance, you know, create the graphics, build on the brand that you've already built. And then it's a case of if I want one blog a month, I can do it. If I want two blogs a month, I can do it. No one's writing it. I mean, it's been proven you can write AI copy and content. And ultimately, Google's just full of algorithms. So you can work the algorithm and then write the copy for that and have a pool of data. The AI mechanism can then 
create the blogs for you and just people pay per month of how much, how many blogs they want to be posted onto the different social networks, for example. It's interesting because I'm working with a couple of clients, one over in Denver on the subscription model base. And the analysis that we did on that project is that we think that it's a 12 month subscription. The average is five months. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, I look at Squarespace. Squarespace is a good model. They've got 1.8 million websites. Roughly average charge is about 279 quid. I think there's different package weights. Yeah. Um, they're putting 457 million a year just on crappy templated websites and people are like, it'd be actually really interesting to get some data on that to see a, a, out of that 297 pound per per site how many of those are still active and yeah, active yeah. businesses behind it because i would think there's a lot of dead weight in that yeah and then the other process that we thought about glenn is that obviously we've got a bespoke brand marketing agency whereas that company scales there's an exit route through that system and then spend some money on a proper agency that builds stuff more tailored you know, but ultimately you don't need it to start with, and that's kind of where we're at. Whereabouts are you based now, Daryl? We're based in Bristol. Okay. Yeah, so we're based in Bristol, and uh, yeah, we've got you know got a good team, and uh, you know it's just about automating systems and processes internally to scale. So some of the stuff you're saying is, I'm doing everything I can to get out of the business. That's so it can grow and people take more responsibility. So. Totally it's funny because there's a couple of people that have actually then, especially through Clubhouse, not on some of the rooms that Adam and I do, but this is pre, pre me not being on Clubhouse a great deal. They've actually come come through and said, "Look, can you can you help me do buy businesses?" And I'm so I, I'm toying with maybe doing an acquisition kind of like training program for people. Mm-hmm. So if you ever wanted some information on how you how you scale out of your business, mm-hmm. and scale the business, I'm more than happy to touch base on that with you, mate. So yeah. yeah. Well, well I'll, done. Thanks, man. I'll, I'll basically, I think I've got you on the Instagram, so I'll message you there and then hopefully. Perfect. Good. good, good to connect. Good stuff. Now we've got about sort of 10, 15 minutes ish. Uh, Tom, Claire, Lisa, I know that you and Sarah, uh, I think she might be busy. And Lisa, do you guys want to ask Glenn a question in regards to your own business? Let's do, let's do a lady. Should we do maybe Sarah? Hi, how are you? Hi, Glenn. I'm I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I'm not my video's not been on, but I'm juggling at the moment. That's okay. Um, we we all do that as entrepreneurs, <laughs> don't we? Um, I'm a divorce lawyer. Um, right. I could, I could have used you. <laughs> I know. When you mentioned about getting rid of the wife, I thought that. <laughs> I was going to say, shall I put you on on retainer now for number three? Absolutely. I'll, I'll let you have details. Number three is not going to happen, don't worry. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm a, a family lawyer, uh, but I'm also, I have a separate area that is motorsport specific. So I, I advise anything legal in the motorsport world because I race in, in my spare time. So wow, got, so you were a woman after my own heart then, really? <laughs> so talk me through more about that. In term- Go on. Talk me more through about that. You know, if I were to sort of ask you in a, a bit of an elevator pitch, what do you do in the motorsport world? Well, because I've been racing, I, I, obviously I get known and I get asked to do quite a lot of things, mainly the family work within motorsport because you get a lot of divorce or people separated because they go and hide their motorbikes and don't tell them what So I, I started off doing, doing family work um, and then the governing body for motorsport actually asked me to do all of their tribunal work. So if when you're racing you get points on your license, you can appeal that. Uh, there's various other things, disciplinaries, that sort of thing that they do as a, a tribunal. So I, I started acting for them for a few years, but I was having to turn clients away. So I was having to turn away the, the, the individual drivers, the teams, which wasn't great. So I decided to, I, I was gamekeeper turn poacher and started acting for the teams, drivers. I've done Formula One transport agreements, debt recovery, driver agreements, sponsor agreements. So pretty much anything in, in the legal realm I, I can deal with. That's fantastic. Adam, has, has, has Sarah, does Sarah know John Fuggle? She know, yeah, John, John's really. part of our group. Yeah, I know, I know he is, but you know, obviously, he's quite big within automotive, yeah? I yeah. do. We have had a chat, an initial chat, and we need to sort of take it a bit further, but yes, we have. Good. That's a really good contact for you to use. And also, you've got Claire, who's below me. Claire, in her last book that she just wrote, actually uh, had an interview with Penny Mallory. Okay, yeah. So the two of you might want to connect just to keep those little feelers out. There'll be another nice one to, to go from there. Um, but, yeah, what do you race? 
At the moment, Clio's, uh, but I've done Porsche Carrera Cup. I won production touring car in 2012. Jesus. Uh, so you're quick. Not bad. That's uh, excellent. Yeah. She's, yeah, being, she's being conservative. <laughs> no, that's really good. That's really good to hear. So funny enough, I've just bought as a bit of fun a Clio 197 Cup. So, oh, fantastic. Yeah. That, that, I did actually, when I started my Clio career, I started in the road series and then moved up to the Clio, the proper Clio Cup. So, so the thing car. is with me, I'm, I'm, I'm not quick in a car, but it's got too many mil, wheels, so two wheels is my, where I'm at. Okay, well, if you want to take the 197 on track, I'll come and give you a bit of tuition. Well, in actual fact, the other person that you need to speak to is this lady, Claire, as well, because I think she, last year, I don't know what, but she got her racing licence for karting. So she's a little bit late into the game, but she, she, I've raced with her and she's bloody quick. Yeah, can definitely connect with Claire. It's a good, good yes, little... Hello. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> good stuff. All right. Now, we've only got about sort of five or six more minutes before we wrap this baby up. Have we got time to speak to Tom? Say again, sorry? Have we got time to speak to Tom? Yes, absolutely. Tom, as I'm going to say that. Mute. Yeah, I know. I was, I was listening in. I have no specific questions. How's your business doing, Tom? Is it scalable or are you just staying where you are and happy or what's the deal? Uh, it is scalable. I've got to get out of the middle of it. <laughs> and it's not as easy as I thought it was probably about 18 months ago. It was pre-COVID. I decided to get out of the middle of it and, and letting go of stuff and getting other people to do it um, has been challenging and, and it's been a learning curve. Still prepared to do it. And, and particularly during COVID, some of the people I've handed stuff to just haven't been coping very well, I don't think. Yeah. And to be fair, mate, my advice to you on that is they're all fucking useless. <laughs> uh, and don't worry about it that they really are I, i've got like a lot of stuff and the way i could get my head around it is that they're all going to steal off me i work <laughs> I, I work in a cash business uh, which is tattooing uh, and they're all fantastic staff but if my back's turned they're going to nick off me so once you've got your head around that and part your ego at the door. They're never going to do it as well as you were going to do it. Yeah, I know. I they're agree. never going to clean that toilet as well as you will, right the way through. They're never going to service a customer as well as you do. Once you get your head around that, it makes it a little bit easier. So it's different. How long have you had your business? Seven years. Uh, yeah, seven years in yeah, June. It's, it's well, a baby. in February, but I didn't actually leave my other job until May, June time. Right, so it's a baby as well, and it's yours, and you want to cuddle it and nurture it. And yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I've got my head around about outsourcing it, and I, particularly during COVID, some of the people I, I, I've worked with before on stuff, I've given them stuff, and they've just not. And, and I, I just think they're, they're just in a different place. Um, yeah. And that's, that's part of the learning. You know, you know you've yeah, come it is. On... Go on, Adam. I was just going to say, Tom's come on leaps and bounds in the last 12 months in particular, and... It's just, in, it's just great to see that flourishment to go from a place of shit, I'm stuck in kind of what I call no man's land of being able to, I suppose, strategically, you know, have your, have your fingers in all these pies to kind of like letting things go. And I think that I'm, I'm very proud of what you've achieved, actually, Tom. And, but there's still a transition. There's still a journey to complete. It, it's a hard gig, mate. It really is. But it, you, you will, you will be feel so much freer probably within about two months of doing it, and then you'll go, Jesus, look at all this opportunity. And funnily enough, the opportunity's always been there, but you've just been too focused on what you're doing. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things. So, um, if you need any help, again, jump on a call with me. I'm more than happy to spend half an hour having a chat with you, and uh, and just almost sort of having that solitary cuddle and a pint going there there mate it's all okay because sometimes <laughs> that's what we actually need <laughs> yeah, absolutely but uh whereabouts are you based tom Gatwick. i live not that close to gatwick but that's my international landmark so gatwick. i live the other side of the motorway in a nice rural area called uh, grinstead uh small field oh. near east grinstead You're yeah really i know do you know oxted yeah, yeah. I used to go to school there. Do you know Rock? Oh, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, no, to, no, I, so, I know well. Smallfield very, very well. Ah, I know around that way. So, yeah, it's a lovely place. All right. Very good. But, yeah, more than happy to help, mate. If you want to jump on a call sometime, I'm, I'm there to, to help out. No, I know that Claire does a bit of mentoring with you anyway, but Claire, I know you've been listening very attentively. Did you, uh, did you want to ask uh, your mentor a question? Did you want to ask me a question before we kind of uh, move on and wrap up the session? 
I'm hoping she's going to tell tell everyone how awesome I am and that they need to speak hey, to listen, me. About listen, listen, listen. And... This is the no ego, no BS mastermind, right? <laughs> <laughs> That case, I've got to go, so I'm going to go now. <laughs> go, 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 go. Um, well, I was just letting everyone just ha have their time with Glenn, because obviously I do some business mentoring with him anyway. Um, but I guess if everyone asks him questions, then I will definitely ask a question as well. Obviously, knowing my business as well as you do, like what's the one thing that you think that I need to be doing better to get bigger, quicker right now that I'm not doing? Time management, which is, is a difficult one, because I think that you you've got a very, very busy life and you've got a family as well, which is also a, a very difficult thing to try and manage. Um, but I think that you need to look at your time management and set aside better timings. Uh, and also realistically lean into it a bit more. You know, I know that the last couple of weeks, definitely that there's been a huge amount of effort um, and there's a new platform coming online, which will hopefully make your life a lot, lot easier. But I think if you to lean into it more now, get over that bump, in actual fact, you'll be able to, will be able to relax off. And I know there's a huge amount of, of work going on in the background, but yeah, just sort your timings out. You know, the other thing I was going to say to you as well, the importance of patience, you know, because all of us want success to mock today, right? Or yesterday, right? But patience yes. goes a long way. Do you know what I mean? And like, listen, I, I, I speak the same language when it comes to Glenn. Speed is currency, right? I love speed. You know, I wrote a great article about speed and the importance of speed. But again, there is speed as well as patience. And there is a balance and a fine tune between the two, you know, because you know, run, running a business, growing a business, we've all got families. I've got kids. I've got four kids, three countries, three businesses come and live in my world. So, you know, when people say that to me, you know, in fact, I absolutely agree. Time management is absolutely key. In fact, what I was going to say to you, Claire, I think Hillary was going to say, do you have like some sort of tool or something for, from a, from a, um, a self-discipline? I think you talked about it last time. Can you just give us a quick uh, synopsis about that? Was it a planner? Uh, I, yeah, I help, I help people with, I've, I've got a planning tool that I've put together, a sort of a planner diary, which does the whole year and helps you review your, your business as you're going. But when it comes down to time management in my sessions, I I get to know the individual and how they like to work and what lifestyle they want. Mm. And then I talk, give them tools that they can use to improve their time management rather than saying, you will do it this way because everybody says you've got to do it this way. <laughs> so it's, it is finding the tools and techniques that work for you and fit in for the lifestyle or the times that you want it to rather yeah. than going, yeah. Here, here's a box, get on with it. I always say have no more than five to do tasks a day on top of your normal workload. That's good. No more than that. And that can be split between work and personal. That'd be my top tip. Yeah, good advice. Good advice. All right. Well, this is good. I hope you guys got some value from our conversations. It's a little bit different from today, you know, purely because I wanted, I wanted it to make it that kind of little bit more personal and that kind of stuff. So Glenn, just want to say thanks very much for spending a bit of time. I know you're really busy and you know, running your empires and stuff. So I uh, hope to see you back on uh, back on Clubhouse on Friday, mate. Yeah, it's the only one I do now, as you well know. I don't even go on Clubhouse to listen to recreation anymore. I think it's just full of bullshit. Um, so a lot of the time I just sort of do your room and just try and serve as many people with honest, tangible advice yeah. rather than I'm going to make you a zillionaire in two weeks and I'm going to create you a pivot table and a, and a funnel and all that other shit that we hear. So, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> Just keep, and I just like to say thank you to, for you what you do. Just keep on doing what you do because it, the message is hard, uh, and I think the support mechanisms that you put in place, I think I think you don't realise how uh, appreciative people are of it, mate. So just keep on doing what you do because it's good work. Appreciate it. Thanks, mate. Really good. So that so guys, listen. What I was going to say, connect with Glenn as well on LinkedIn, and he's on um, Instagram as well, Tattoo Tycoon, and on LinkedIn and a couple of other platforms. I'm sure he'll tell you about or whatever it is. But feel free to connect everywhere. With just, just search Tattoo Tycoon, you'll find me. <laughs> so, so do that. So, mate, listen, I just want to say thanks very much again for your time today. And I'll catch up with you uh, offline and, and also see you on Friday. That's great. I've got all these books to catch up reading now, so I'll, uh, I'll catch you later on. <laughs> all good, mate. All good. Good to see you guys. Take care. Cheers. Thanks very much, Glenn. Hey, you guys. I just want to say thank you so much 
for listening in to this episode of the Game Changers Experience. I hope that you got some amazing value, some great insights and golden nuggets that you can implement into your business straight away. I would really, really appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review on the button below. Have a fantastic day and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care.